Hey, Terrence. Hi. <laughs> well, we're just here uh, talking about beer, actually. So, you know, it's Friday. It's perfect for um, beer time, for happy hour. Yeah, I I should be having a beer right now, actually. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why I'm not. <laughs> right afterwards, maybe. So we're wondering, uh, for all you guys waiting as we uh, have about seven more minutes till we start, what is your favorite beer? We'd love to know. Go ahead and type it on the chat bar on the right. I think, I don't know which side is the right, but mine is this way. Yours must be this way. Yeah. So Terrence, what is your favorite beer? Um, well, right now it's um, the, the spring. And so I just had um, like a grapefruit IPA. Ooh. The other day, I guess that's probably one of my favorite summer styles. So it's always that good. sounds really good. Yeah. 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 How about you guys? Go ahead and type in onto the right your favorite type of beer. Let's see. I like a half of Eisen, and I like that anytime actually. I do also like really dark beers. Yeah. Um, that's because Bel- it's always it's always warm in California. So <laughs> Belgian beers are good. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's see here. Root beer, Carmina says. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> Barilla. <laughs> that's actually really good. Depends the kind of root beer. High life. Yeah, mm-hmm. we we were just talking about um, lawnmower beers, and uh, <laughs> is that a, is that a lawnmower the, beer? High life? Yeah, I, I would. I think so. You know, it's the uh, it's the easy the easy drinking beers. Okay, but is it a pale lager? Is high life pale lager? I believe so. It might be a Pilsner, actually. Ah, okay. Yeah. Is Pilsner on this list? Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, second from the bottom there. Second yeah. from the bottom. Okay. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not schooled enough to know the the technical difference between a Pilsner and a Lager. If anybody well, knows. you know more than I do. I think. <laughs> I I have some some friends of mine do do home brewing and stuff, and uh, obviously like. Um, craft beer is is a big deal in Michigan. Yeah, you were here for the AIGA thing. Yes, so you remember. Yeah, everywhere I go with uh, AIJ, there's always a brewery involved. So, which is nice <laughs> because it means that craft beers are really coming into play in everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. So Samuel says that he loves a simple blue moon. Have you had that before? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's my uncle's favorite. Hmm. I don't think I've had that, but. I know it is popular. Yeah. Anyone else? Any beers that you like? <laughs> Maybe we're not a beer drinking crowd today, huh? <laughs> Hi, Kat. We hear you. We hear you have that you like Miller High Life. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, let's see. I'm here in Los Angeles. And then uh, Terrence. You're coming yes. in from Grand Rapids. I, yes, Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is uh, what we call the, the third coast. The um, third coast. <laughs> yeah, uh, which is the, the west side of Michigan. Okay. So that's how we, we differentiate that, you know, Detroiters are from the east side, and uh, we kind of just, Grand Rapids is the, the second largest city oh, I see. after Detroit. I yeah. see. Mm-hmm. So where is everyone else coming from? Where are you guys drinking beer right now? Actually, we should have actually had beers in our hand, right? I know. We, we I can. Know. We can. I can go over there and get a beer. Yeah, I know, right? Kat, where are you from? Samuel, where are you calling in from? It'd be nice to know. So let's do a uh, do. Let's see. Cecilia says cider. Um, cider. Here in Los Angeles. Yeah. Ah, Chattanooga. Very cool. cool. <laughs> I want. I want to go to Tennessee. I haven't been to Tennessee. I haven't been either. North Carolina. Very cool. Awesome. People from all over, yeah. So let's do a quick tour of your office. Would that be okay with you? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Right. Um, so let me let me tilt my screen here. You can see uh, this is my cocker spaniel Wilbur um, on the chair here. Is he sleeping? Uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> He's half asleep. He's used to the, the sound, I guess. Um, and then uh, on the, on the chair, I have like an unstuffed uh, monotype pillowcase thing. And then uh, this this poster here that says "Quality Type for Electronic Publishing" is uh, a vintage poster from uh, Monotype in the UK. 
from I think about 1993 or something like that. Mm. Um, it was designed by Phil Baines, and he told me it was one of the first uh, graphic design projects he had out of college. Um, I, I met him there when I was in London for the, the Gil Sands um, launch and stuff. So uh, that was cool to chat with him. <laughs> and really then, nice. yeah, on this side, I have um, a, a, a poster. Uh, I designed like just a set of numbers. Um, and for, for a local art show, I just had the numbers printed and everyone was asking me, you know, <laughs> Everyone was asking me like, "What? What is it? What is it? You know, tell me about your art." And I'm like, "I, I just, I just drew these numbers and picked some colors." Um, there's a seven and a three actually I printed, and then I got a couple, a couple goodies just on my desk there. Uh, some other, some other monotype swag stuff. I have a, um, a little postcard from uh, that says Detroit, and that's from the Detroit wood type. Uh, letterpress printing company. I can't remember the name. Hmm. Um, and then this, uh, I have this Apple mug. It's kind of hard to see, but that's also like from the 90s too. And I, I kind of borrowed that from uh, Tom Rickner and our Chicago office because he, uh, he used to work for Apple um, back in the day, uh, working on fonts and stuff before he went uh, to Monotype. So. so you borrowed it? Yeah, I borrowed it. <laughs> Maybe he's on right now going, hey, I was wondering where that was. It's on loan. Yeah. Okay. I'll give it back to him if he asks for it. <laughs> okay. hmm. Well, it's recorded now, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, he left it in the cupboard with all the other crappy coffee mugs. So I see. I think that's, that's fair. Very I, cool. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, uh, let's see. Teresa says that she's in San Francisco and she needs a watermelon beer. So, Ooh, I've never, <laughs> I've never had a watermelon beer. Is it good, Teresa? It's probably sounds. I mean, it sounds refreshing, especially for the summer, right? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Oh, and then I got uh, Jay from the Monotype New York office too. There. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Hello, Thanks, hello, Jay. everyone. <laughs> so as we're getting started, can you do me a favor? And there's a button underneath our video screens It's called share. If you'll just click on that and let everyone know we have quite a few people registered, but not everybody's here in the room yet. And we're going to get started. So if you share it out, uh, you can let everyone know that we're getting started. Um, and then they don't miss out on any of the talk. So while we're waiting for everyone to get in, I just want to welcome you to Topography Dojo. This is where we learn from the masters of topography. And we're joined today by Terrence Winzerl. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, close. Wines Winzerl. Winzerl. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's a type designer at Monotype. Actually, type, uh, Terrence and I had met two years ago at TypeCon in Washington, D.C., where he gave a great talk about fonts and food packaging. I think mm -hmm. you talked spoke about cereal boxes too yeah, yeah i have a couple of those recycled Great. in here yeah you'll see them again excellent yeah so today he's gonna tell us a story and it's gonna be about his adventures in kerning and curiosity yeah Ter terrence you want to <laughs> introduce yourself a little bit more because i know i didn't tell you all tell about all the things that you do um yeah sure that that's fine i um i've been um, focused on typography since probably about 2006 um, when I was studying graphic design in college and just kind of uh, fell in love with type. And I had like an advanced typography class where we designed our own typefaces and then I was in, in love with it from then. Um, and uh, I was I was really lucky and um, got an internship just straight out of college uh, with with Steve Madison and Ascender Corporation in Chicago was where I started, and um, they were all uh, of of Monotype vintage, and then um, sold their company back to Monotype uh, in 2010, I think it was. Um, so it's been it's been good just working with that sort of same uh, same crew of people and uh, lots of new people too. So. Um, that's kind of how I got started, and yeah, it's, it's good. I like it. I still like it. <laughs> and you design other things other than type, correct? 
Yeah, I yeah. So um, at Monotype, I spend most of my time is on custom commissioned fonts um, for for Monotype's clients. Um, on the side, I do um, I practice lettering and and calligraphy, and I kind of use those as um, to add variety to my my practice. Uh, but it also just helps me draw better, and uh, that's kind of the the long term goal. Um, and I'll I'll come back to that too in one of my slides. So great. Yeah. Well, shall we get started? Sure. Okay. Um, just pull up the tab here. Um, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk you know a lot about kerning, <laughs> uh, but I, I I wanted some alliteration for the title, so it's, uh, so don't. Oh, don't so don't worry, it's not it's not too technical. It's false sale, false selling. Yeah. Um, uh, also, if everyone if no if everyone has a an issue seeing us or hearing us, please let me know in the chat bar so um, yeah. I can make adjustments. Okay. Yep. Whenever um, you want to show it. Okay. Okay. So are you ready? Yeah. Can you see this? Okay. Wait, wait um, I can't see anything yet. Um, see if you can oh, screen share it. Yep, there you go. I got it. Hold on. Um, oops. Uh, hold on a sec. Let That's me okay. This. You, you can't do full screen at first. You'll just have to show the window. Oh, got it. I, I know. I know. I know what I'm doing. It's okay. my my browser is. Uh, okay. We had it set a second ago. There we go. <laughs> we did. That's okay. <laughs> I got it. Okay. Can you see that? I can. Okay. And now? Great. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> got it. Um, yeah. So uh, here we go. This is, uh, yeah, uh, my, my new word mark I just uh, designed actually uh, in the last uh, month or something. Um, so I wanted to start off with a couple of just takeaways, and and one of the one of the FAQs that I get is is what's what's the difference between a, a typeface and a font? And I think it was Nick Sherman who said um, a song is to an MP3 what a typeface is to a font. And so the the typeface is is the design, and the font is the mechanism that uh, that captures that. And so you can imagine how a typeface could live on a wood font or a metal font or in our case you know digital fonts um, so it's always it, it I, I find it really helpful to um, you know think about how fonts worked in in metal or wood and how those kind of those concepts you know uh, relate to um, digital fonts um, the second FAQ I get is usually about spacing and stuff, and I was uh, this. I'm, I'm borrowing this from uh, this lettering book from the '30s, I think it was maybe. Um, and I think one of the misconceptions is that you know letters have to be you know measured a certain distance apart, uh, or that their anatomy has to be a certain measurement apart, and that's not necessarily true. Uh, the goal that we that we do for um, the default spacing and you know adding the kerning on the fonts is this idea of like uh, balancing the surface area or the volume kind of between the letters. So um, you know if if all else fails or if you're if you're kind of questioning how you're spacing stuff, it's uh, it is it is an optical adjustment kind of thing. So um, try to imagine. Uh, filling the negative space with the same amount of water or sand, whatever. So those are the two uh, takeaways uh, from today. But um, <laughs> I, I wanted to get into a little bit more of uh, just some some personal reflection and um, and kind of how uh, those those kind of things uh, just helped me be a better designer, I guess. Um, my uh, my mom. Is uh, or, or was an industrial designer, and she worked in the toy industry, um, and she did uh, like doll heads and stuff. But I was uh, in love with Legos for a long time, and so uh, I well, I still love Legos. But I think what I find interesting about it today is that I've always uh, loved this kind of um, construction and sort of working, uh, you know, designing things and 
with this kind of construction and uh, these kind of um, um, restrictions that that you have. And so I think I think playing with Legos kind of gives you uh, a sense of of design in a way because you have a certain number of options and you have these restrictions and you have to you know make something uh, within that. So these are two of my original designs. Um, this was actually uh, one of the first typefaces that I that I designed, and this is going to answer um, Lisa's question. And she was asking about, um, you know, what what lessons did I learn from uh, my first my first uh, designs? And I I used to be embarrassed to show uh, this stuff because I was just I don't know trying too hard to impress people or something, but um, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm not afraid of it anymore, but I think this is this kind of showing of a milestone and this will relate to some of the, the other stuff I show later too. But um, so one of the first, you know, the first things that I was learning uh, about, about type design is um, stroke contrast and sort of the, the difference be between the thicks and the thins and uh, where they should go and uh, where they shouldn't go. Also a lot of stuff about um, optical adjustments. So um, overshoots, uh, those kind of um, technical things that come along with type design. And also um, prototyping or the value of prototyping. So in this case, uh, this was all done with an illustrator before I knew how to use uh, font software. So, um, but and by the value of prototyping, I mean that I had you know kind of drawn all of the letters, and then uh, when I wanted to make a change to the stroke contrast or whatever, you can see that I would have to go through and um, change that on on every single letter. So it was very it was really time consuming. Um, and so, you know, when I'm designing new type today, obviously I do, uh, I'll only do a set of maybe 10 letters and do iterations faster. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what I mean by prototyping. Um, but I think really the, the biggest lesson um, for this was that I, I learned that I was kind of facing a, a really big mountain and this mountain of, of learning type design and, and learning typography and but I liked the challenge of it and I could see I could see myself um, you know learning more about typography you know over over my career and um, so that's kind of around the time when I was just um, you know becoming dedicated to it and uh, yeah I also was learning about just how difficult it was to draw smooth curves <laughs> and so I wanted to show these uh, lumpy S's here too, because this was this was the best I could do at the time. Um, and um, so Can yeah, I... so, yeah. So what is the name of this typeface? Oh, I was I was calling this like uh, West Fallen or something. Um, it was never really finished or or published, obviously. Um, and uh, so yeah. <laughs> And when did you design it? This was probably um, 2005, maybe. Okay. Um, so probably my um, my sophomore or my junior year in college. Great. Um, and that was that was around the time when you know, like I said, I, I fell in love with type, and um, I was just starting to build my portfolio. And that's you know when it, when I bought the URL typeterrence.com. And uh, so I've been kind of committed to it since then. I found this this clip art, and I think it looks a lot like me with like <laughs> the hair. It's really it's uncanny, and like the era of the computer, it's really uh, perfect timing. I think so. <laughs> it's funny. Um, and then sort of early early in my type design career, just fresh out of college, you know, I um, every everything I made was rejected, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, I think um, a lot of a lot of young designers would would see this too. And just sort of, um, you know, going through this grind of, of learning the learning your, your discipline, and um, having having everything kind of sent back for for revisions. Um, so it took me um, probably uh, you know, two or three years before I could 
um, you know, draw some type that wouldn't get sent back <laughs> by uh, my supervisors. So mm. that's okay. I think that's that's natural. Um, like I said, when I was first starting at uh, Ascender, um, we were um, uh, working on these these really uh, high tech um, designs and these really um, demanding environments. So um, the the work that we continue to for uh, for these clients, like at, at Monotype too, is um, just really the most uh, you know the most bulletproof um, technical uh, fonts that we can do, and um, so I, it was very much you know trial by fire when I was first starting uh, to design typefaces and kind of working at, working on these two um, uh, Sego and uh, well Droid Sans before Open Sans, but really these kind of situations where uh, you know um, the mistakes were were high stakes. So it was kind of stressful at the time, but um, it was good trial trial by fire. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think um, one of the things that I was thinking about when I first joined Monotype is having this uh, this legacy of such um, uh, a, a vast you know history of, of typefaces um, and sort of all, all of these these demands too. So uh, you know. When you when I was first starting at Monotype, it's like holy crap! What can I what can I design that will be, you know, of value to this this library of fonts? And um, how do you how do you follow you know Helvetica and Gil Sands and and you know Times New Roman or just you know any of these uh, just huge uh, you know flagship kind of um, designs? And so. Uh, it's it was hard, I think. Um, one of the things that I've always been a fan of of Eric Gill's work, and uh, he has this really nice um, slab serif uh, text face called Joanna, which was designed um, later in the '30s, um, which I think is is one of his best designs because it was um, one of his uh, one of his last type designs. So he had been practicing for a while. He was really uh, did more lettering and stone carving and stuff, and he only became a type designer later in his life. And so this was one of my favorite uh, um, guild designs. Uh, but the fonts that we had were kind of in need uh, of an update. And um, I was also looking at uh, because uh, Monotype keeps an archive of these. Um, uh, drawings and stuff from you can see Eric Gill's signature there for uh, 1928 and these drawings for Gill Sands um, and these live in the, in the archive in the UK uh, and sometimes they pop up in New York and stuff and special shows. Um, so it was really, really wonderful. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah, super cool. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you know some of these things were were definitely um, influencing me and thinking about how I could. Um, you know, add to this kind of, uh, add to this area of, of Gill's work. And so my first idea was that, okay, like I wanna do an update of, of Joanna, um, but then along with that, I wanted to have a palette of, of, of typefaces where, um, uh, to have a sans serif companion with Joanna. So, you know, back in the day you would, you would pair well, you could still pair them, but Joanna and Gil Sands together because uh, they're they're related enough and uh, they they would work well together. But I w was thinking about you know publication design and stuff, and um, so I thought it would be really nice to have a, a really specific um, Sands companion to Joanna that was more similar than Gil Sands. And so this was one of my first uh, prototypes for uh, Joanna Sands, and you can see uh, Joanna Sands in the middle there, and just kind of how it relates to uh, both the Joanna design and the Gil Sands design. Hmm. Um, and then I spent um, three years um, designing and, and developing uh, Joanna Sands Nova. And that was part of the, the Gil series that was released uh, just in November and uh, where we did an update of Joanna, which was called Joanna Next, or I'm sorry, um, Joanna Nova, and then um, the, the Gil Sands. Nova, so all three Novas. 
Um, and here's just a couple a couple samples of of how uh, the typeface was working. This is these are still pretty early too. Um, you can see I did some fake magazine layouts there, and uh, that's what I was thinking about how it would be used. You had me at British cheddar. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. And xylophonist. I think yeah, that's that very, that's, <laughs> they match. Um, and so I, you know, at this point in time, I could draw a smooth S. Um, and so I, I wanted to show this kind of in comparison to, uh, you know, the S's I was drawing uh, in college. So um, that was kind of, uh, this, this was a milestone for me because I was finally um, sort of up to speed enough that I could um, handle designing uh, a whole whole typeface family uh, from the concept to the execution and, and sort of planning the whole family. So this was a, a big deal. And I worked a long time on it. And so that's just kind of the other point I wanted to make is that, you know, design as as craftsmanship or or design as um, this a, a practice and a discipline, and it's not you know it, it's not something that um, it's not it's not easy all the time, and I think it's it's just like any other any other skill um, you want to develop, you have to put in the time, and uh, and you'll get better. Um, around after, after um, I think about. Um, two years when the, the Latin was finished, um, it was uh, um, picked up for uh, the uh, Barnes and Noble Nook. And <clears throat> so they needed um, Greek and Cyrillic. So uh, that kind of extended the, the project of the family. And so uh, I had to design um, Greek and Cyrillic for the rest of the family too. So um, that added about another maybe 18 months to the development time, I think. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. So uh, that's yeah. Also, kind of why it, it took um, so long. But it's also, you know, the situation where you have, uh, you know, um, an opportunity, and so the opportunity just kind of kept getting bigger, so, or like as a learning opportunity. So then it's like I, you know, um, was working through, you know, designing. Um, something from something from scratch too, and so in this case, you know, the original Joanna didn't have a, a Greek or Cyrillic. So, in this way, you know, the Greek and Cyrillic is is more of an original design of mine, whereas the Latin is really kind of as as if a, a collaboration between uh, Eric Gill and myself. So I had you know less reference material basically. Um, and um, yeah, this kind of answers uh, the second question with um, Cecilia. And um, it was her question about, you know, when you're considering a typeface uh, for, for digital use. And the, the question is, is it, it really depends on, on what the end use of the typeface will be. Uh, I think many times we are kind of developing stuff that is just shooting for the middle where we want to have something that will work um, in, in print and on screen. And um, so it's kind of a, um, a situation where it, it, just, it just depends on the project brief. Um, but, you know, sans serifs are, are pretty uh, durable. So in that case, you can design a sans serif typeface that will work for, uh, for print and screen. I think um, serif typefaces are a lot more sensitive uh, to size and also just kind of reading length and stuff like that. So um, that's where we see, you know, variants of like display versus text or those kind of optical sizes or even um, some typefaces, you know, you'll see that are optimized for the web. So that might be um, either like a design change that was kind of required in order to make that typeface work on screen or um, just, you know, other technical kind of upgrades to it. So I think um, she, she mentioned, um, you know, looking at cell phones and I, I don't really proof um, type on my phone because it just looks too good. Because, you know, <laughs> okay. your iPhone is, you know, 300 and, and whatever PPI. So, 
um, I find it more helpful to look at the worst case scenarios. So I would look at, you know, what, is, what does this look like um, with, you know, auto hinting on like a Windows browser and stuff. Uh, and so I right. think that's, it's easier to find um, sort of those, you know, look for the breaking points. Um, so it'll, it'll kind of always look good on your iPhone. So, uh, right. yep, less, less helpful, I guess. Um, and yeah. so another, this is another kind of milestone here, but um, looking back at um, my, my typeface design work in, in college and um, kind of uh, later on in 2013 and 2014. And so the, the lesson that I was kind of taking away here was uh, comparing myself to myself. And I think, you know, it can be, it can be really easy to get caught up with, um, you know, comparing yourself to, you know, superstar designers or just anybody on the internet, really. It's like you can, you know, uh, I think the internet kind of puts everybody on a seeming, seemingly like level playing field. And so uh, it can be really easy to compare yourself to someone who, uh, you know, has 20 years more experience than you or something like that. So I think um, that's just kind of that idea and uh, of, of growth and, and personal growth and um, sort of, uh, I think, you, you want to have the, uh, the most improved award. It's kind of the one that you want. Uh, I think play is, is really important. I'm gonna speed up a little bit because it's already uh, 25 after, but um, some of the things that I, that I do to, to play and kind of help me um, develop, like I said, lettering and calligraphy. I think um, I started uh, picking this up maybe as a, just as a reaction to working on a computer all day long and um, just drawing whatever I wanted to, whatever I wanted to draw <laughs> just for fun. And so um, okay. it helps a lot. I, uh, American Gladiators, you remember that show from the nineties when they like, they shoot tennis balls at each other and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I was wondering what your, what the words were going to be after the words American <laughs> Gladiators. They're also great pet okay, names good. too. So if you need to name a cat or something, okay. there's a whole list on Wikipedia. Um, I found uh, workshops to be really helpful at like TypeCon or even I think, um, you know, the stuff that that TypeEd and, and Rachel and uh, Michael are doing is super awesome. Um, and so that can help. I took a workshop for brush lettering and it like changed my life. And it's just this, you know, mm. uh, a $3 marker, you know, that I, I just didn't know those kinds of markers existed, I guess and uh, kind of just opened my eyes to more of this uh, illustration world and sort of the other side of, uh, of, of typography with, um, you know, besides serious UI fonts and, and all that stuff, we have this other, this whole other world of, of illustrated and uh, illustrated type and calligraphy and lettering. And um, I did, uh, I, so, as one of the things to kind of help me develop my lettering skills, I, I did a little bit of volunteer work. And this was for just a local organization doing like a party for the park system or something. And uh, that was super fun. And I, <laughs> it was, it's all like nonprofit, you know, so it's kind of a pro bono thing, but I gave them like 20 options because I just, you know, gave them a whole packet and they're like, oh, wow, do you usually do this? And I was like, no. Uh, so they, they picked this other uh, dry marker thing. And um, it's, uh, I mean, I did some, you know, Wilbur gets his own word mark, uh, just other, other fun mm -hmm. stuff. Lino linoleum cuts, which I hadn't done since I was in college. Um, this is what my dance or electronic album cover would look like. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Lovely. Fun stuff. So, <laughs> uh, but as you know, all of these things are just helping me draw letters better, which is kind of the, the end game. And I also, what I love about lettering too, is that you can, you can sit down and draw something in maybe like three hours uh, and have a finished piece. Whereas, you know, a lot of the font projects I work on last weeks or months or years in certain cases. So, mm -hmm. It, I think it was also kind of, you know, uh, it, it helps to have a little bit of uh, that kind of timeline variance too, just to keep it, keep it interesting. 
for a for a quicker yeah, sense of yeah, accomplishment, exactly. right? Yeah, just to um, yeah. yeah, do do it faster. Um, and that, and that's what I love kind of about uh, Instagram and just kind of keeping it like a, a almost like a sketchbook and and just being able to kind of you know pop some things out and uh, it's interesting when you when you start collecting and seeing that as a collection of images uh, it starts to stand out and you can you can find patterns in your own work that you might not see uh, from day to day but um, look at it over a greater period of time that's kind of you know what I was saying about you know personal uh, like reflection, reflecting on the work that you have done, and and looking for things like that. Um, I wanted to show a little bit about um, food packaging and stuff, just because uh, everybody wants to see the Domino's fonts. I think um, this is kind of like my cereal box formula of the brand, the the photo, uh, the flavor, and the details, something. Um, kind of fun. I like this um, uh, ice cream that looks like graffiti. I know my man, my man Jay in New York is a big fan of graffiti too. Um, I love this uh, risotto lettering here with this big, uh, this big ligature. Um, and <laughs> we're yes. talking about uh, lawnmower beers, but I, I think, um, yeah, like I, I, I think food packaging is really interesting and. Um, this story about how Miller Lite, their sales had declining, um, you know, for six years in a row or something, and all, and then they changed their packaging to this vintage uh, white um, package, and their sales have been climbing since. So you know, it's something, it's something so easy, um, but it, it just shows you the power of of the packaging. <clears throat> and being, you know, playing playing the right tune for the right audience. Yeah, it's right. good. Just yeah. <laughs> and it's a pilsner. <laughs> exactly, and it goes well with mayonnaise. <laughs> no, um, yeah, I, I, and I what I love about food packaging too is that it's um, it's such a it's such a good like typography exercise because you can relate um, the flavor or the or the texture or something and kind of. Uh, helps kind of um, uh, describe the, the concept of, of type and and using a different um, a different sense of yours, um, and so I think I think there's a really strong tie there between um, type and, and food and sort of how you can um, describe something easily. You know what what do these flavors of, of mayonnaise mean? Or what's the you know what's the cheapest mayonnaise or what's the most expensive mayonnaise? <clears throat> Those kind of concepts. Um, yeah, a couple of just just beauty shots of the the, the pizza press um, stuff. Again, this was um, the ad agency Crispin Porter and Bogusky in Colorado uh, commissioned uh, Monotype to design this for them, and they were already using. Um, trade Gothic with the rest of their packaging. And so uh, this was really, this set of fonts is really to complement uh, everything else that they were doing. And um, so I, I was really fortunate to <clears throat> kind of um, be the the only designer, I guess, on this project. So I can, you know, call it mine instead of, uh, you know, working with, I, I usually, you know, usually work with a couple other people. So it, it's sometimes it can be hard to just you know say that a project is is yours you know um, because of all those all those collaborations and stuff. But I was kind of the the, the lead designer for this and um, and so uh, yeah, definitely my my most popular project to date. I guess it helps that you know Domino's is airing you know ads on TV every day, so uh, that definitely helps for exposure reasons. Um, and the yeah, fact that they serve <laughs> pizza, come on, it's pizza. It doesn't get any better. It's that's what I'm, it's, that's what I'm saying. It's a dream no. job, um, and uh, yeah, it looks it's really cool once you start seeing something like in those brand colors too. Uh, it really starts to resonate. Um, a couple of my my research photos here, looking at um, older uh, American Gothic designs, sort of before Trade Gothic was around. So which which designs influenced Trade Gothic? Um, deep cuts, you know, if you will. Um, this engraved D over here is from, 
I think uh, 1901 around there. So it's kind of just looking to see how uh, these these kind of uh, stripes and and details were were handled before. Um, here's kind of a process shot and how um, you know some of the design details that we had looked at to kind of uh, compensate for uh, this inline shape. And you can see like the top G you know, with the spur on the bottom, it's really kind of awkward with that, the inline shape in it. So, um, you know, that's something to, to cut out. And so, you know, kind of thinking about how these other details will, uh, will influence everything else, right? So once we had to pick, you know, the one, the design of the one or the flag on that one right there, that would, you know, that design decision would be, you know, applied to all of the other weights. So. Uh, it's something that you couldn't foresee unless you knew that you had to do an inline weight since the beginning. And the, the striped shadows were a, a huge pain in the ass and um, <laughs> the, the most difficult part of it and the most time consuming. I did, uh, you can see a couple of the, the prototypes here. I tried a lot of um, just uh, mechanical striping and uh, different weights and uh, nothing was nothing was really working perfectly. So what ended up happening is that I had to uh, manually adjust the angle and the spacing on all of the stripes for the diagonal shapes um, so that they look like they're in the same direction and they look like they're the same spacing even though they're not. Yeah, <clears throat> oh so gosh. there's, yeah optical adjustments oh for each of the, the stripes. And if you look at other, um, you know, other kind of striped, uh, other striped styles like this that are uh, on the market, you know, right now, you can kind of see the ones that were made quickly uh, with just a clipping mask and because you'll, you'll be able to notice in these uh, diagonal areas. So, um, and, you know, the, um, Man, the, the ad agency just does great stuff with it too. I think um, it just, you know, it, it's one thing to just be working on a typeface and, um, you know, not having any of the other copy or anything else or illustrations that they're gonna use it with. And so that's really the most rewarding part for me is seeing seeing the work in the wild and, you know, seeing it on the, the finished product is the, is the best part. And um, so I thought this was, you know, I was I was pretty relieved, I guess, when I got <laughs> when I got my first uh, you know pizza package with this on. And I think it's I think it's called flexographic printing. Is that right? With the yeah, mm -hmm. the big uh, kind of stamp yep. basically, and you can see how kind of the ink is nice. kind of squishy. And um, so fortunately, it it survived and uh, and was working. So yeah, That's it's cool. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, just seeing it on all, all of their different. Uh, uh, touch points and stuff and iPad apps and all, all kinds of stuff. Um, I uh, So while I was researching um, the the Domino stuff, I kind of, uh, you know, stumbled upon some other uh, wood type designs that I really liked and uh, started exploring into these, these octagonal um, things. And, um, and so I spent um, about well almost almost two years kind of designing uh, a big a big mega family of um, octagonal stuff, and that was my Kairos family. Um, and yeah, I'll just show you kind of some of these. Um, I'm doing some like homage uh, layouts to um, old wood type specimens and stuff. We'll talk about shipwrecks, things like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, specimens are just really, really fun too. And about like, you know, choosing words that you think would, would help describe the, you know, the character and the, you know, the, the typeface and words like Sarge or, or. Do the type designers usually design um, their own specimens? Yes and no. Um, sometimes it, it's kind of hard. Uh, I think, I think most type designers, um, do I think uh, maybe maybe my situation is kind of not a good example because um, you know we have other uh, graphic designers and other marketing people and stuff that kind of um, do that work you know um, so it kind of depends but I think mm -hmm. um, it, it's uh, yeah it's fun 
um, and I was doing some some other uh, chromatic um, uh, tricks with this that I kind of learned with or you know liked with uh, the domino stuff. So made a, um, a highlight weight and stuff for this. Um, and then I yeah I just kind of went crazy with it right and made another fifty styles of the the sands and um, the different widths and stuff and. Um, uh, so actually, I designed these graphics here, actually. Um, so that was kind of fun. and, and uh, But it was also like a collaboration because I was borrowing the um, the color palette and stuff that some of the other designers had picked. So um, yeah, other fun stuff. Um, yeah, and like I said, um, a collaboration too. And uh, so these are some of the specimens that uh, the, the monotype designers did with um, laser engraving into um, some wood and I think this really speaks to kind of the industrial nature of the typeface and sort of you know What does this typeface look like on these kind of industrial material? Um, places so this is uh, etched in copper and um, Screen printed on rubber. So these are super cool um, and then uh, I also had some like paper coasters printed. I think I might have sent you some Rachel. I don't know. Did you get some? Of okay. Okay, good. Yeah. Yep. We're using <laughs> and the t-shirts, <laughs> which you got some. So hopefully there's yes. a lucky winner out there today. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just had, had a lot of fun with that too. And I think even something like the paper coasters or the t-shirts is this kind of, uh, that kind of happy place between, um, you know, me doing serious font work and then also that kind of, that kind of playful attitude, like I mentioned, and um, just, you know, giving giving yourself room to um, do something for for fun on purpose, and kind of that. And, and I think, at least me personally as a designer, I I do better work when I'm in that that play state of mind instead of uh, the the work state of mind. I suppose. Um, just uh, concluding here, um, I did a, a talk for um, Creative Mornings here in Michigan. Um, last fall and the theme was action. And so I talked a lot, there's a video on um, Vimeo. I think it's it's not very good because I, I say um like 300 times and I was I was nervous, but uh, <laughs> um, but I think I, I was looking at a lot of, uh, spent a lot of time talking about habits and sort of this idea of like slow burning action. And, um, and I think that's really, that's, you know, habits are so powerful. And, you know, I kind of came to this conclusion that action is this you know, combining your goals and your habits. And, um, I, and I imagine it looking something like this, where you're, you're doing this, this habit and this action over and over again. And then every once in a while, you have to, you know, change your goals and you have to kind of um, flip things around and try something new um, or start a new habit or try to kill an old habit. Um, and I think it's it's a, a constant um, a constant battle, but I think you know that that kind of uh, those things keep flowing, and so uh, you have to stop every once in a while and look for those opportunities to uh, to change if you need to. And so this is my final my final mantra that I like to conclude with, but uh, focus on on you know progress and not perfection. And so that's what that's what I have for you today. Great. Yeah, thank you. Yay. Thank you. Okay, so back to the video. All right, so okay, I love good. the talk. It was very I went good. over a little bit. I know it's uh, 48 um, after, but it's okay. It's it's all good. Let's just let's answer some of these questions if that's okay. Okay, so the first one is What's your favorite movie word mark logo? Uh, thanks, Brian. Yeah, that's um, that's funny. I, I I don't know. That's that's a hard question. I think I when I think of movie logos, I think sort of the the famous ones come to mind, like um, Jurassic Park or Ghostbusters. I I really love the the little Ghostbusters cartoon. Uh, it kind of never gets old. Um, but I think in many cases the the movie the movie title or like the movie word mark isn't that really exciting. But once uh, you have it with the photography and the animation and stuff, that's what really makes it. I think that's more exciting. 
Right. I always feel like with word marks, once you apply it across the board, or it really yeah. ends up into a branding campaign, yeah. that's when it gets Definitely. life. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Next question. Oh. Samuel says, Man. San or serifs? Yeah. Which do you that's, lean more uh, towards? It's a good question. I think, um, you know, sans serifs have been wildly popular for the last um, 75 years or so. Um, and they're, they are the, the reigning king right now, definitely. Um, but I think, you know, I think we still see the, the value of serif typefaces and they definitely have more, uh, more lineage and definitely more um, design options to explore because there's that many more, you know, moving parts with a, with a serif design. And, um, and there's still, you know, new serif type design you know, every day. So, um, yeah, I, I would love to right. do more serif work myself. Um, but, uh, you know, many of the commission projects and stuff that we do is sans serif. Yeah, definitely. Do you have a personal preference? <laughs> I, um, I, I think I, I like sans serifs more. I I'm kind of a, a modernist kind of dude. Okay. I love, I love mm -hmm. Adrian Frutiger and stuff. And, <laughs> Um, so I've been looking at a lot of like art deco sans serifs and stuff too. So I'm on board. I'm on the sans train. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think everyone else is too. I mean, when it comes to geometric sans serifs, yeah, they're yeah, all over right the now. place, right? Yeah. Let me ask you a quick question then. Um, there's always some talk about which one's easier to read in body text and long flowing text. Sans, oh yeah, serif yeah. Serif is serif. easier to read for body, absolutely. Um, yeah, es especially on paper. I, I think there's certain, you know. I think um, I've seen I've seen serifs used like in in interface design and stuff for apps, and I think um, it adds a lot of right. flavor. Um, but it, you know, I think it can be. Um, it, it can mismatch, I guess, the style of the, the interface and stuff. So, yeah, Depending yeah, absolutely. Depending what the brand is, right? Yeah, yeah. What I find most interesting is there's a lot of, um, Michael always talks about Radiohead type fonts where you can't really categorize it. So they have some interesting, like one side will be one type of serif and the other will be like a yeah. slab. And then, you know, yeah. this they're starting to really mm -hmm. mix it up. Yeah, I yeah, definitely. Okay, let's yeah. go to the next question. I work for Domino's and we are using both Pizza Press and Trade Gothic yeah. as a main typeface for the brand. I was wondering, could you elaborate what your design process was for Pizza Press? It's a great font and I love using it. I would like to know a little more in depth what you were thinking. Yeah, while you were yeah exactly. It. I think that was, um, so the the brief from uh, the, the agency, um, Crispin Porter McGusky was, they wanted this contemporary Americana feel. And um, they had provided me with some, uh, you know, more of a project brief. And they kind of knew that they wanted these, these stripes and, and inlines and stuff. Um, and um, so, you know, really the, the concept was, we, they wanted something that would match the trade Gothic family but was um, that was different, but also had the functionality of those uh, those chromatic fonts and being able to to layer them. Um, so that was the that was the goal, and it, it has a really small character set because of sort of you know the intended markets and stuff. So um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Wilbur's up, I think. <laughs> He's scratching. <laughs> And I notice I have all this sunshine come in for some reason. It's just Los Angeles. Okay. So Carmina is asking, what medium do you prefer to work ah, with? Yeah, that's a good time? question. I love, um, mm -hmm. I love markers, actually. Um, and so I use kind of my two favorite uh, tools are there's something called a Pilot Parallel calligraphy pen. And it's a cartridge-based um, calligraphy pen. Um, and they're really good. They're about 10 bucks a piece, I think. Um, and you can just rechart or just re refill the little cartridges. Um, and my second favorite is a Tombow, um, dual, uh, dual tip brush. And so it, they just any, basically any marker that has like a foam tip brush, I really like. 
Um, I found that just, you know, it's my personal preference. I, you know, I've used the other calligraphy tools with the, um, the dips and, um, you know, real paint brushes and stuff. And it's like, they're so it, it's, it's more fussy and, um, you know, you can get better lines and stuff with certain tools, but I, I, I maybe I'm just impatient. Uh, but I just like, I like markers. Uh, I like the feel of them. So, uh, that's, that's kind of what I've, what I've learned to prefer. Um, and it's, it's clean, you know, the markers, it's like, you don't, you know, uh, you don't have to clean up anything. And so, uh, and usually in my case too, is that, um, the work that I'm drawing like analog with, with markers and, and, uh, pens and stuff is never my final artwork. I'm usually, you know, 99% of the time I'm digitizing stuff or, um, kind of, you know, working it later. So, um, having a super clean, um, you know, analog drawing is not usually my finished product anyway. So. Well, the parallel pen mm -hmm. is really nice. There is a yeah, little bit right, of cleanup. Because it's with still it. ink. Yeah, I think the, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, the thing with like a, um, like a broad tip calligraphy marker is that you don't get the quite as sharp lines as you would get from the metal tools. Right. So that's the only, that's the drawback. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice, it's a nice tool though. Yeah. And I do it's like, funny. I was, I was thinking about this yesterday, but like when I was in college and we're using like, uh, um, the, uh, rapidograph pens, which are uh, a pain in the ass. Yeah. I never liked those either, but like, and also like the white gouache right. uh, with like a, a paintbrush and stuff. And my, my colleague, uh, Jim Ford, who does uh, lettering and stuff too, he like just carries around like a bottle of, uh, like just plain white out <laughs> and, I'm like, dude, that's, this is way easier. So I am also a fan of just plain white out. So yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay. Last question here. Where did you find your research Ooh. resources for dominoes? Um, the library? Yeah, that's a good question. I, um, I have, um, a number of kind of antique specimens and stuff that I've bought on eBay. Um, which are not cheap, like the uh, American Type Founders books and stuff. Um, that's the the resources I had at the time. I think um, Steve Madison had sent me a couple photographs too of uh, things that he had in his library. Um, but mm -hmm. I think um, there's a, a great library in Chicago called the Newberry, and they have a huge collection of uh, typography related stuff. And you know, I, I have to admit that I'm, you know, I'm not a great historian. It's not my, it's not a strength of mine. Um, so when, I, when I'm doing, you know, those kinds of, of research, um, I'm not, I'm not writing a, a thesis paper about it or whatever. So I'm really kind of uh, looking for aesthetic things and, um, and, and finding, uh, finding visual ideas instead of sort of, uh, you know, writing a, a biography history or anything. So um, that that's, I guess, just just how I work. But um, <laughs> other other. I would love yeah, to see the right? research paper, though. You have to you have to go to Reading <laughs> for a year. So yeah, <laughs> got it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Very cool. Well, that's and the end of the questions from everyone. Do you remember offhand what which which one was the most I, interesting question? I really question? liked. Um, I think it was um, the first question about um, that Lisa asked me about the first typeface that I had made and and what lessons um, I learned from that. So that was that was my favorite question. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Well, Lisa, I'll get to send you out this <laughs> beer and topography shirt. So very cool. Congratulations. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Terrence, for sharing your story and your adventures and yeah. craning, even though there's only a little bit of craning in yes. there. Yes, well, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for having me. It was very cool. It was very cool. So yeah, so if you guys are more interested, um, you can also check out um, Kairos family on my fonts. There's a link at the bottom to take a look at the whole family. It's quite uh, large. Um, let's see, I can also send you all some notes about where to find the Pentel pen and the Tombow. And then Terrence, do you yeah, also have a uh, website of your own? Com or, um, yep, you can find me on like right. Instagram or Twitter. It's all uh, at type Terrence. Mm -hmm. Two, type two Terrence. R's with okay. an A. Great. <laughs>
<laughs> there you go. Thanks so much again. Great. Okay. Thanks so Thank much you. again. And thanks everyone for joining yep. us. Thank you. Bye-bye.